Moments before the clock struck 8 o'clock, the sound of 353 Imperial Japanese aircraft impeded the dewy morning of December 8, 1941. Fighters, level and dive bombers, and torpedo bombers came in two waves, launching explosives at the U.S. naval base in Pearl Harbor. Of the eight present battleships, all were damaged, but four were sunk. Of the four sunken ships, all but USS Arizona were raised from the water. Six of the battleships were ready to return to service at a moment's notice. 2,403 Americans were killed, and another 1,178 were wounded in the deadly attack. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor came with so much brutality and malice that it forced the end of a year-long lengthy debate. World War II was raging across the water, and for a time, the United States had chosen to be a neutral spectator. The attack on Pearl Harbor shattered the hope for continuing such non-participation. America had no choice but to officially declare war and intervene in both the Pacific and European theaters. On December 9, 1941, with only one dissenting vote, Congress agreed to declare war. This moment will have forever changed the empirical meaning of air combat. The U.S. needed to act fast. The attack at Pearl Harbor was fresh, and amongst the gory casualties, Americans were angry. Only a handful of carriers were left in the Pacific. They had to fill the ensuing void and demonstrate the raw potency and capability of naval air power. The United States had the advantage here, regardless of the devastation. Geographically, the position of the U.S. gave the Navy a strategic advantage to move ships between the Atlantic and Pacific fleets through the Panama Canal. When you think about the Navy in World War II, often we think of battleships and submarines, true aquatic warfare, but it was incredibly crucial to employ air combat tactics in our evolving strategies. Fighter and bomber aircraft were, to any one side, the pivotal facet that would lead them to triumph or failure. The U.S. Navy turned a corner entering World War II with a state-of-the-art fleet of aircraft that left a lasting, prideful legacy. In the Atlantic, air operations consisted of a blockade campaign to protect Allied convoys carrying raw materials, munitions, and reinforcements to the European theater. In the Pacific, the Allied strategy focused heavily on stopping Japan's rapid advance of destruction. Bitterly, the task was contested, driving enemy forces back through a broad expanse. The U.S., despite having been spectators, was woefully unprepared to execute either strategy, Atlantic or Pacific. Navy and Marine Corps air arms mustered up one small and seven large aircraft carriers, five patrol wings, and two marine aircraft wings. In total, there were 5,900 pilots. 21,678 enlisted men, and 5,233 aircraft of all types. The distance between the two warring countries and the industrial power allowed the U.S. to build just enough ships, aircraft, and other necessary equipment that would lead the country to victory. Armed American forces drove the Axis forces from their strategically located bases, blockaded access to all raw materials, and placed the Allies in sublime strategic positions to launch air and amphibious offenses. Later efforts were considered unnecessary after the completion and green lighting of the Manhattan Project. The fleet's presence in the Pacific and liberation of Japanese-held islands is what ultimately made the atomic attacks possible and successful. For the first time in naval history, opponents were engaged out of sight of each other. Radar gave the fleet a brand new pair of eyes and as technological progress improved, so did the defense and power to the offense. Scientific principles were applied to operational tactics and scientists continued to develop specialized equipment. Logistics assumed a new, higher role of importance in warfare, and advancements in replenishing materials at sea increased naval mobility. Throughout World War II, Navy and Marine pilots destroyed more than 15,000 enemy aircraft, sank 174 Japanese warships, destroyed 447 Japanese merchant ships, and sank 63 U-boats in the Atlantic. The legacy that remains continues to inspire future naval operations. Technology was all but stagnant before World War II. No one ever wishes for the detriments of war, but in dire times such as this, advancements come in troves. 
Several iconic aircraft were designed, modified, and assembled in a short amount of time. The most infamous of the lot was the heralded SBD Dauntless, a dive and scout bomber whose speeds reached upwards of 255 miles per hour. First built in 1940, the Dauntless allowed pilots to dive at an 80-degree angle. Dauntless was an older model created before the war even began, but she proved her worth time and time again. The SBD Dauntless played a crucial role during the Battle of Midway, delivering final strikes to the Japanese carrier and camps below. She may have been slow, but she was deadly. Eventually, the Dauntless was replaced with the SB-2C Helldiver. The oldest aircraft was the most important one in the entire fleet, the SNJ Texan Trainer. Developed in the mid-1930s, the single-engine Texan Trainer was a training aircraft. She was tough, durable, and reliable. Featuring two seats, one for the trainer and one for the student, the Texan Trainer prepared young pilots for war. Unlike the aircraft her trainees would go on to fly, the Texan Trainer would not be officially retired until 1995. To this day, the aircraft is well-loved by aviation enthusiasts across the country and frequently appears at air shows. In 1943, the Navy deployed the F-6F Hellcat Fighter, otherwise known as the Aluminum Tank. She was a carrier-based fighter strapped with two 50 caliber Browning machine guns or two 79 caliber AN-M2 cannons and four 50 caliber machine guns. She could carry up to 4,000 pounds of explosives for up to 944 miles. The successor to the F-4F Wildcat, the Hellcat became well established as a sturdy and deadly aircraft that could absorb incredible amounts of damage and keep on flying. The Hellcat featured foldable wings and a standard three guns per wing. By the end of the war, she would be credited with the destruction of over 5,000 enemy planes during her service. The United States was not prepared to enter World War II when it did. The Great Depression wreaked havoc on the American economy, trade, and general advancement. The American dream was dead. But despite the woes and struggles imposed, the U.S. stepped up to the plate and delivered history's most idolized patriotic performance. Aviation was at its peak, and while the official formation of the United States Air Force took control of most of the military's aircraft needs, the Navy continued to strive forward just the same. Modern naval aviation is nowhere near what it used to be. Nearly 80 years ago, aircraft were non-computerized metal machines that took more guts than smarts before jumping into the cockpit. Now, with the extreme technological expansion, aircraft can be silent, undetected, and untraceable. The Boeing FA-18E and FA-18F Super Hornet, for example, is a series of supersonic twin-engine carrier-capable multi-role fighters. Their top speed comes in at an astronomical 1,190 miles per hour, with a cruising speed of 777 miles per hour. Can you imagine what Hellcat pilots would think about the Super Hornet? Or what about the Lockheed EP-3, the multi-intelligence land-based reconnaissance aircraft? The new Navy left such an impactful, lasting legacy that without the engineers, pilots, and strategists, we wouldn't be here today. During World War II, the Navy was exploring the potential use of helicopters, but was heavily overshadowed by fighting beasts that carried the Allies through the war. Officially, the Navy has used them operationally since 1946, but true developments didn't come until the 50s and 60s. Post-war developments brought on the early beginnings of the aircraft we're most familiar with today. After World War II, jet aircraft became a common picture on the runway. The first jet landing was made on the HMS Ocean by Lieutenant Commander Eric Brown in a specially modified Day Haviland Vampire LZ-551G in 1945. By the mid-1950s, angled flight decks were introduced on carriers. If a pilot missed the arrestor cables or bolter, they would simply be able to increase engine speed and become airborne again instead of flying straight into the ocean. In 1958, the USS Enterprise became the first aircraft carrier to be fully powered by eight nuclear reactors and was the second surface warship to be powered this way. The arrival of the Sea Harrier VTOL and STOVL jets 
brought about the surge of fixed-wing aircraft utilizing shorter flight decks. This ultimately cut down on the size, weight, and roundness of carriers, allowing the leftover budget to be utilized in technological development. With 113 years of aviation history under its belt, the Navy continues to carve at the cornerstone it has become. From fleet air defense to anti-surface warfare and disaster relief, the United States Navy is a formidable force to be reckoned with. If you like this video, be sure to like and subscribe. Let us know down in the comments what you want to see next. Until next time.